You mentioned the potato a moment ago, and I thought you had very interesting things to say there about how cultural factors influenced the adoption or non-adoption of, of particular um, crops. And I thought it was very interesting that even though the potato was available for for um, a couple of centuries, it wasn't really until the, the 18th century that sort of cultural factors were overcome and it became a, a staple crop. Yeah, well, it wasn't just that. I mean, it was, it was really, a, it sort of became a necessity to eat it. So scientists were very keen on the potato when it first arrived in Europe because you could produce a lot of calories for much less effort out of a given amount of land. And so this was sort of seized upon as a solution to feeding the poor. The poor themselves weren't terribly keen on the potato. It, it looked a bit weird. It grew under the ground. It was unnatural. Because we forget that, you know, the crops that we eat and the animals that we eat were domesticated so long ago, we assume that's a sort of natural state. Yeah. Uh, some people even said that because the potato wasn't in the Bible, you mm. could eat it. It didn't have a sort of holy endorsement. And it was only in the 18th century when a series of wars and famines meant that people re- resorted to eating potatoes because there wasn't anything else. So they discovered that actually they weren't that bad after all. They were very versatile. And then, of course, somebody invented the French fry, which didn't do any harm, either, I would have thought. But um, it, was, it was an interesting parallel, I think, with the way people um, guard genetically modified foods today. Again, scientists are often very keen on them, but uh, you know, a lot of people are suspicious and think they're unnatural, like potatoes. And I wonder whether, similarly, the need to, you know, people essentially will have to, will have to adopt them this century because it will be the only way to produce enough food with a, with a changing climate and with... Uh, soil becoming more salty or the need mm. to produce crops using fewer inputs while maintaining yields and so on. So I wonder whether there's a parallel there. I'm certainly, I'm certainly struck by it. But mm. yes, people essentially were forced to eat the potato and then discovered it wasn't so bad. Well, yes, I mean, I, I was wondering about your views on the benefits of, of what you describe as taking a historical step backwards in actually shedding light on contemporary debates, I mean, such as issues like whether we should be eating more local food or not. Yeah. So what I do in each of the six sections of the book, at the end of it, I link the historical period in question to a modern food debate. So the discussion of the domestication of the first plants and animals leads naturally to a discussion of, you know, if they're unnatural, then is mm. GM food really any any um, less natural, as it were? Yeah. Uh, we've already meddled with the genomes of these uh, with these creatures, so isn't it just a continuation of that trend? Similarly, when discussing food trade over long distances with the, the spice trade, local food is what um, presents itself as, as the issue there. In fact, it turns out that um, you know, the Romans worried about this, that bringing all that pepper all the way from India wasn't that a bit sort of... They weren't worried about its carbon footprint, but they just were worried about the enormous amounts of silver that was required to pay for it. Mm. There wasn't really anything the Romans had that they could, uh, that they could offer in return except for silver. So I, I look at that, and I think the answer on local food is that sometimes it's better and sometimes it's not. So the, uh, the blanket expression that, you know, you should always buy local. I mean, there are reasons to do it for sort of community cohesion and to keep your local shops going and so on. But on environmental grounds, it's far from clear. Sometimes the local product is better and sometimes it isn't. And what I'd like to see, I mean, I'm interested in, in low carbon food. Mm. Uh, and I think if we had carbon labels, and Tesco has been trying to do this for a few years, but it turns out to be much more difficult than anyone thought. Uh, but if we had carbon carbon labels on food, or if we had a carbon tax, which meant that the carbon emissions associated with producing something uh, were, in, were built into the price, were reflected in the price, it would be much easier to choose the, the low carbon foods. And some of the time those will be local, some of the time they won't. You quote a Chinese proverb at the beginning of your, your final chapter, which runs, there is no feast which does not come to an end. And that sort of brings to my mind um, Jared Diamond and collapse and you know, looking, yep. at, looking at sustainability or non-sustainability of entire civilizations. And I wondered, in conclusion, Tom, if you could just say where, where you personally sit on the optimistic, pessimistic spectrum, having, you know, having researched yep. this book. Um, I suppose I am... I am an optimist overall. I don't think it will be easy, but I think what's striking is that if you look at, if you can look at human history as a repeated series of crises that were resolved with technology. So farming was arguably a technology that was adopted to enable people to support more a larger population, and then industrialization was a, you know, it was a response in Britain actually to a food shortage, which was Malthus pointed out that there wasn't going to be enough land to feed everyone. And he was right, but what he failed to take into account was that if you switch everyone from an agricultural to an industrial lifestyle, they can produce goods which you can sell and use that to buy imported food. In fact, Britain went much too far down that road and ended up importing 80% of its wheat by the end of the 19th century. Mm. 
So we've since kind of the pendulum swung back again. Uh, and then if you look at the predictions of you know, imminent famine in the 60s, they were proved wrong by the Green Revolution. So as a person who's reasonably optimistic about technology and looking at foods as technologies, then history looks a lot like a series of disasters averted by, by innovation. And I think the, uh, the pessimists tend to underestimate consistently the innovation that arises, particularly when we're in a tight corner. Humans can be very innovative. Now, that said, of course, there is a selection bias going on here, which is had there been a, had, had any of these crises not been resolved by technology, then we wouldn't be here to talk about it. But by and large, I think there are lots of avenues to pursue. You know, biotechnology is one of them, but actually there's, you know, rediscovering traditional methods can, to, can do a great deal, putting more money into basic agricultural R&D, I mean, just better roads and things in much of the developing world would mean that uh, less food rotted before it got to market. I was in Uganda last year and you know, subsistence farming there uh, was still unbelievably primitive and people were still sowing maize. They were just sort of scattering it. They weren't spacing out the plants, which can ensure that uh, you know, they, they grow more regularly and are, even, are easier to harvest. And the government you know, has not been putting as much money into, into educating people about basic stuff like that as it could have been. So I think there's huge potential to improve the production of food. The climate obviously c- confuses things as well. But by and large, I think um, I, you know, I am optimistic that there won't be some big catastrophe and we will be able to overcome this and we'll just need every tool in the box to do it. Tom Standage. An Edible History of Humanity is out now in paperback. You can find out more about this book, as well as several million more, by going to blackwell.co.uk. That's all for this podcast from Blackwell Online, so thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye.